It's wonderful to be here in South Africa. I was here 10 years ago. Oikos brought me here 10 years ago and had a wonderful time uh, discovering all the, all the beauty of this country. And I've missed my time uh, in South Africa, so I'm very glad to be back. Oikos has brought me back again, and it's just a real pleasure to be here. I love South Africa. We've already seen lots of good stuff, and we're going to see more. So uh, uh, it's very nice to be here. So what I'm talking about today is homeschooling the environment for genius. And uh, don't feel like you have to take a lot of notes if you normally take notes, because they're all going to be on my website. So if you go to drwild.com and click on handouts, and then click on the title of this talk, You're going to see all that stuff. Uh, Also, if you do these things, you can like me on Facebook. Everybody likes to be liked, right? Um, So go ahead and like me on Facebook if you want. Um, To give you a little idea of who I am, in case you're not as familiar with me as uh, some folks are, um, I was a university professor, actually currently a university professor as well. I'm teaching a little part-time at Anderson University. But I was a university professor back in the 90s. um, And uh, during that time, I helped develop a high school which in our state of Indiana was very unique. It was for gifted and talented students. So it was for students who were above average. Uh, and they would come and live on a university campus and take classes like they were university students, but they were still in high school. And that was a lot of fun. And it only cost the Indiana taxpayer $9,000 per child per year. And that was back in the early 90s when $9,000 was a lot of money. Um, I did uh, do a lot of research uh, in my field of nuclear chemistry, and in the U.S., the way you do research is you have to find sort of an infinite vat of money to pay for your research. So, of course, you go to the taxpayers for that because they are an infinite supply of money. So I got my grants through the National Science Foundation, which is tax-supported. So if you ever lived in the U.S., thank you very much for your contributions. Um, the reason I got interested in homeschooling, I, was, I had very little knowledge of homeschooling back in the 90s. I was a professor at uh, Ball State University, and I started uh, uh, encountering these students who were just simply head and shoulders above the others. And one time, a student was in my office, and he was, you know, obviously he, the stuff I was teaching was very simple to him, and he was really asking me some questions that you would expect of a much more mature student. So I, I told him, you know, you, had a, you must have had a great chemistry course in high school. Where did you go to high school? And he sat at home. And I really had no idea what that meant. You know, here I was a university professor, but I had no idea there was this thing called homeschooling. And, you know, so I said, so a tutor came to your house? No, no, my mother was mostly in charge. And so I said, so she has a degree in chemistry? No, no, she never went to university. And it was just shocking to me that this student was just way above most of my other students and had somehow learned from his mother. Uh, And I didn't really know much about that, and you don't want to put students off by asking too many questions. Uh, So I kind of let that drop, but I put it in that pile of things you'll look into at some point in your life, you know? And, And so I didn't pay much attention to the fact that this student was homeschooled and was doing very well. But when I encountered my third student like that, who was head and shoulders above all the rest, homeschooled, I decided I needed to know what this homeschooling thing is. So I started doing, and you have to understand how a university professor thinks about things, because we're different from everyone else. A, A smart person, if he wanted to learn about homeschooling, would go to talk to a homeschooling mother, right? And Because they're the experts, they're the ones doing it. But a university professor isn't a smart person. A university professor doesn't, you know, because we don't do anything at university, but we study things, and that's what makes us experts. We haven't done it, but we've studied about it. So rather than going to the people who were doing the homeschooling, I went to the research to find people who had studied homeschooling, right? And in my research in both the U.S. and studies in Canada, these students were not unusual. The research is really clear that, on average, homeschooled students perform significantly better at university than everybody else. So that's why I started getting into homeschooling. I saw the products, and at university, the products impressed me so much that I decided that I had to work with homeschoolers. And I had no concept of writing books for homeschoolers. I was simply going to homeschool conventions like this one and telling uh, homeschooling mothers how good their students are, Uh, how to apply for university, things like that. Uh, But they eventually convinced me to write some books and so forth, so that's what I do now. I write stuff that defends the Christian faith, and I also write 
books for homeschoolers, and that's probably how most of you know me. But the real point here is I didn't get into homeschooling because I knew anything about it, not because I had kids to homeschool or anything like that. I got into it because my university students impressed me so much uh, that I wanted to simply uh, uh, start working with what turns out, at least in the U.S., to be the best model of education that exists. So that's what got me started. Now, the interesting twist to this story is after I've been working with homeschoolers, after I've been writing books, and if you, if you want to know what it's like to be a university professor, here's the picture. For a few years, I was writing materials for homeschoolers having never done any homeschooling myself. But I was an expert at it because I had studied it. And that's what being a university professor is like. You're an expert on something you've never done, right? <laughs> so what happens is that a couple of years after writing these textbooks, my wife and I adopt a 15-year-old girl. And we have to start homeschooling her. <laughs> and that's when I really learned <laughs> what homeschooling is all about. What this talk is about is about genius. And first we have to define what genius is. Because, you know, usually when we think of genius, we think of that guy, right? We think of Einstein. He's the genius. Now in a few minutes, okay, it's going to be more like half an hour, I'll tell you who, what really makes a, a Einstein a genius. He's not a genius because he knew a lot of stuff. That's not what made him a genius. I'll tell you what made him a genius in a little bit. So first of all, we have to understand really what a genius is, and it's important to understand that according to the Oxford English Dictionary, and if anybody knows what an English word should be, it's the Oxford English Dictionary. It says, one with exceptional intellectual or creative power or other natural ability. Geniuses aren't just scientists and mathematicians. They're artists. They're musicians. It's people with some natural ability that somehow sets them apart from everyone else. That's what makes a genius. So some geniuses do work with science and technology. So another great genius is Edison, who can create new things and create new inventions. But of course, to me, a much better genius than Edison was Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci or someone like that who created wonderful art, right? Because that's that exceptional creative power that they can do. And so, you know, unfortunately today, <laughs> we tend to focus on those things that uh, make money or are practical. So we think about genius in terms of technology, computers, science, and so forth. But there's a lot of great artistic and musical uh, 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 genius out there. And we have to recognize that that's a kind of genius. And it's an important part of genius uh, that, is, that is important for our culture as a whole. So the question is, what makes a genius? And I'm sure there are a lot of factors that go into it. You have to have some level of ability, some, level, some right shuffle of genetics and all of that. But there's clearly some sort of um, development that goes along with genius. So Dr. Harold McCurdy, who is a psychiatrist, and you know, we as natural scientists kind of look down on people like psychiatrists and so forth because, you know, people are so different. How can we ever say anything conclusive about what makes people tick. Uh, but nevertheless, some psychiatrists think they can figure out what makes people tick. And what's really funny, God has a sense of humor, because when, when my daughter went to university, she got her degree in sociology, which to natural scientists are even, is even worse than psychiatry, <laughs> right? Because now we're trying to study societies? Oh, come on. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this psychiatrist decided he wanted to see if he could take a few examples of real geniuses of the past. And the people he studied were people like John Stuart Mill, you know, an incredible philosopher. Uh, Blaise Pascal, who was an incredible scientist and philosopher. Or John Quincy Adams. You know, these guys are knowledge. It's common knowledge these folks are genius. And the, he, what he wanted to do was look at biographies of them from people who knew them or, or uh, someone very close to them, look at their biographies and specifically concentrate on their childhoods. And we want, he wanted to know, is there something in their childhood that made them genius? And if so, it's something we as parents ought to you know, promote and so forth. So he looked at uh, their childhoods, and among these 20 uh, uh, geniuses, he found three things that their childhoods had in common. And when I read about this study, and it's a little old, it's a study from the 1950s, but when I read this study, it really was remarkable to me what these three things were. And I think you'll see why it was remarkable to me. So, the first commonality he noticed was a high degree of attention focused on the children 
by parents and other adults expressed in intensive educational measures and usually abundant love. And what he means here is, when it came to education, they didn't go to a school. They ended up being taught either by their parents or a close friend of their parents, right? And so their main kind of uh, education was one-on-one with an adult, right? So here's what he says, and this is a really important quote, yet it is not the educational program itself which requires our notice, so much as the intimate and constant association with adults with which it entails. And I think this is real important for homeschoolers to recognize, and this is something that in my experience as homeschooling is very important. It's not the educational program itself. It's not you must use Cambridge. It's not you must use Saxon. It's not you must use Matthew C. It's not that. It's whatever works for your child, the key is you are the ones who are being the ones guiding it and involved in it. It's the intimate and constant association with adults. It's not what math curriculum you use. It's the fact that you're with them right along learning this math, sometimes learning this math, sometimes relearning this math, right? But it's because you're doing it with them. And I think that is a fundamental thing that sets homeschooling apart from every other educational method. Uh, In in most educational methods, you know, we ship them off to some expert. And it may not be a teacher in a classroom. It may be some tutor or something like that. But we tend to ship them off to people we think are experts, and we let the experts do it because they know, right? But the fact is, according to at least... Dr. McCurdy's study, these geniuses, that wasn't the way it was done. The way it was done was lots of different programs were used, and that's one thing he noticed, that if he looked at all 20 geniuses, they had all different approaches to how they were brought up uh, in terms of their education. Some read the great books, you know, some read the philosophers. One of them just was uh, told to read the dictionary and the equivalent of what was an encyclopedia back then. You know, so there were all sorts of different methods But the key was, regardless of the method, there was an adult there, one-on-one, helping them. All right? Now, why does that promote genius? Why does that foster genius? Well, I think one reason is, if you're uh, you're in a one-on-one situation with an adult, as a child, you're much more likely to focus than if you're in a group with a lot of other children and one adult trying to take control. Right? So in the end, one-on-one attention really helps the student focus uh, on what's important. Also, it's very easy for a student to get bored or get frustrated with a subject and wonder, why do I need to learn this? What's important about this? I'm never going to use this. I don't know if you've heard that yet, but you will. I'm never going to use this. Why do I need to learn it? Uh, And that's a typical child's mentality. A child doesn't think in the long term, thinks in the short term. It's your job as the parent to make it clear that this is important. And and if you can't generate enthusiasm, (laughs) at least generate the resolve that this is important. And I think a parent is more likely to generate that enthusiasm or resolve than a child. And especially if the adult knows the child. And when I started homeschooling my own daughter, that's what I found. If I could figure out a way to relate it to something she already liked, then it was more likely that she would learn it. But if I didn't know her, I wouldn't be able to do that. So even the best teacher in the world has sort of a limited knowledge of her, his or her student. Teacher's not going to be as good at doing that as a parent is because you really know what turns them on and turns them off. And so you're more likely to generate this enthusiasm, this resolve, and so forth. So that was one commonality they found. Okay, here we are. Now, Here's one important thing that's, and you can tell it's important because it has two exclamation points. One thing that's important is none of the parents of these geniuses that he studied were geniuses themselves. Most of them were educated in some way, and most of them valued education, but John Stuart Mill's father is not somebody you recognize because he never made any significant contribution except making John Stuart Mill, right? John Stuart Mill's mother, same thing, right? So it doesn't take geniuses to make geniuses. Geniuses are made when the right talents and the right environment come together. All right? 
And you are ultimately responsible to their talents to some extent because it's your genes and your spouse's genes, but you can't control that. That's already made. What you can control is environment, right? And so you can at least make the environment that will perhaps foster this genius. So what's the second thing he noticed? The second thing he noticed was reduced contact with the peer group. Here's, here's what he says. Not only were these boys often in the company of adults as genuine companions, they were to a significant extent cut off from the society of other children. And I think significant, uh, genuine companions is a very important part of his statement. What he said was they, weren't some, they didn't go places just because it was their parents and they had to follow their parents, Right? or it was their parents or the uncle or something like that, they were with these companions because, or they, with these adults because they genuinely enjoyed each other's company. Right? That's what they were doing. They were hanging out together. And when I uh, uh, homeschooled my daughter, this was the thing I noticed. You know, we started just hanging out together more. You know, we had genuine companionship. And this goes away, I think, to a significant extent, when you ship your children off to school or someplace else, eight, eight hours a day, five days a week, you know, it's, it's harder to develop that kind of genuine companionship. But this is one thing that at least McCurdy's study indicated is important. Now, why does this foster genius? I think this is pretty obvious, right? The peer group is not very wise. <laughs> Don't know if you know that. <laughs> And, of course, one thing the peer group does, which is really, really uh, common, is it sacrifices long-term gains over short-term pleasure, right? So why do I need to study? Because I'd rather play video game, right? Uh, that's the peer group's mentality. If you have reduced contact with a peer group, you're less likely to have that mentality, right? It's just the case. Adults provide a wiser, long-term approach not only to learning but to life in general. You know, and the fact is, if you're going to want to learn about how to be an adult, are you going to learn that from a kid? Or are you going to learn it from another adult? Right? If you're going to learn what's it like to have a good life, are you going to learn it from a kid who's lived 10 years? Or an adult who's lived 30 or 40? Right? So in the end, I think adults provide a much wiser, and if we foster a lifestyle that has the adult always alongside the child, not only when it comes to education, but when it comes to anything, then in the end, I think the child has a better chance of looking at the long-term approach rather than the short-term pleasure. Now, please understand, this isn't complete isolation. I'm not saying take your child and, you know, make sure he never has contact with another child unless it's a sibling ever again. Peers are important for friendship, companionship, fun. And this is how you learn about relationships and how difficult and pleasurable relationships can be and so forth. So they're very important for all of that. They're simply not guides, right? So the way we, we're talking about isolating from the peer group is not making them the most common thing in the child's life. When a child goes to school, his friends are with him pretty much more than you are. When, it, when you're at home, you still have friends and you still do things with friends, but you're with them more than their friends are with them. So in the end, you're much less likely uh, to, you know, have a problem. Um, my father was the assistant superintendent at one of our maximum security prisons in the U.S. He was in uh, a criminal justice. And his job, when he reached that assistant superintendent level, his particular portfolio was he had to what we call matriculate incoming inmates. So if there was someone who was newly convicted or someone who had transferred from another jail, he had to bring them into the system of that jail and tell them what they had to do and where they were to sleep and all that thing. Well, the process of matriculating, he was required by the state to ask the inmates certain questions. And so he had a list, I think it was 15 or 20 questions, that he had to ask the inmates. But then he was allowed to make up some of his own questions, just for his own knowledge. And so he made up a few extra questions, and one of the questions he asked all of his inmates, it was one of his questions, was, if you could tell your parents one thing that would maybe keep you out of the situation you're in now, what would it be? And he said overwhelmingly, like 90% of his inmates gave some version of, monitor my friends more carefully. Right? 
Obviously, it's not my friend's fault that I'm in jail, but my friends contributed to it, right? And so the inmates understood that a large part of their problem had to do with they had too uncontrolled of a peer group. So I think that's part of what isolation means as well. It's not necessarily isolation from everyone, but it's isolation from the ones you'd rather have not have them influenced by. You know, and we had to do that with our daughter too. Especially at her age, there were men that we didn't want her to be influenced by. Right? So we just said, these aren't your friends. They can't be. Right? And I think that's really important. And the, you're not going to be able to monitor their friends more carefully if they're spending a lot of time away from you. So that's what, that's what we're talking about, about isolation from the peer group. All right? One other thing that he noticed, a significant amount of imaginative play. And I'm, unfortunately, I think we're getting away from that in modern times. Uh, but nevertheless, what he noticed was, and he called it, this is back in the 50s, so he called it fantasy. Here's what he says. Fantasy is probably an important aspect of the development of genius. Instead of becoming proficient in taking and giving the hard knocks of social relations with his contemporaries, the child of genius is thrown back on the resources of his imagination and through it becomes aware of his own depth, self-conscious in the fullest sense, and essentially independent. And so what Dr. McCurdy is saying is, if you don't have a lot of friends to distract you all of the time, you end up coming up with ways to enjoy just being with yourself, right? And so you end up creating these wonderful imaginative worlds and these imaginative friends and so forth. And we're not saying take them away from the kids so they can develop this, but if the normal thing you're doing is monitoring the friends more carefully and making sure, you know, the, the, the friends aren't taking up a huge amount of their day, then in the end, the children will tend to fall back on this. And so imaginative play. And this has amazing benefits. Probably of all the three to me, this has the most importance to benefit. Because when a child uses his or her imagination, it produces this tendency to think outside the box. And when you can think outside the box, and I know thinking outside the box is difficult. Think about education, right? You're all homeschooling. Most parents would say, I'd never try to do that. But why would they never try to do that? Mainly because almost nobody does it, right? Everybody does it this way. If you're doing it this way, you're outside that box. And that's bad, right? No, that's actually good. If you're willing to think outside the box with your home education, your child can think outside the box with all of his or her education. And it can make a huge difference. So it can be end up becoming bringing originality to virtually any endeavor, right? And there are a lot of great benefits like this. Sir Ken Robinson, and you know he's important because he has the sir in front of his name, right? So he's been knighted for uh, his contributions mostly to education. Um, he argues that we don't get the best out of people because we are educating these days to make good workers. And, and if you look at most educational programs, that's exactly what it is, right? You have to fill the child up with enough knowledge so he can do this job. You have to fill the child up with the right number of skills so she can do this job. That's generally the way we think about education. But that's not what education is. Education is to develop thinkers, hopefully creative thinkers, right? Because that provides a lot more benefit, I think, even to the family, but especially to society, than a good worker, right? So he says students, and this is so true, students with restless minds and bodies, far from being cultivated for their energy and curiosity, are ignored or even stigmatized, stigmatized with terrible consequences. As he says, we are educating people out of their creativity. And isn't that true? I mean, what happens when the child is, you know, bored because he's already got it and everybody else is still trying to learn? What happens with him? I mean, I don't mean to brag, but I was this kid. So I sat in, 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 in class, and I got it the first time, and she was on the 50th time, right? And I was just bored. So I spent a lot of time in the principal's office because I would, of course, act out. I would misbehave. That's what happens. You know, if you're curious and you want to learn more, that typically isn't fostered much. What, what's fostered is sit in your a desk, be still, and learn what everyone else is learning. It doesn't matter that you're interested in this thing over here. Learn what everybody else is learning. That's what school does, right? But that's not what creative thinkers do. 
Creative thinkers see this and think, oh, well, what about that? That's what makes them a good thinker. But schools don't, don't do that very much. So let me tell you, what, uh, so for, I told you I'd tell you what makes Einstein so, uh, uh, such, a, such a genius. It's not that he knew a lot. He knew a lot, but that's not what made I know a lot of people who know a lot, and they're not geniuses, right? Here's what made him a genius. You see this astronaut floating in the, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, space station. So she's up there floating in the space station. Why is she floating? Why isn't she on the ground? Well, it's because she's not experiencing gravity, right? So most people think she's not experiencing gravity because there's no gravity up where she is. But that's false. She's in the, uh, she's in the, uh, she's, you know, orbiting in the space station, orbiting the Earth. If you had a ladder and you climbed up, a little tall enough ladder, and you climbed up to where her orbit is, and you saw her pass by you, and you see that she's floating, and you think, oh, there's no gravity here. I should float too. If you jump off that ladder, you will plummet to your death. There's a lot of gravity up there. It's less gravity than what's here, but it's still enough to pull you in. There's plenty of gravity where she is. The reason she's floating is because her orbit is what we call a constant free fall. An orbit is a path in which you're always falling towards the earth and missing it. That's what an orbit is. So she is constantly freely falling as if she's plumbing into the earth. The only thing is her capsule keeps missing the earth. And that's what makes her go in a circle in orbit, all right? So she's not experiencing gravity simply because of her motion. And if you went up on one of these tall buildings on an a, on a, on a elevator, and you got to the top and the cable broke, and you started plummeting down, for a brief time, you would experience no gravity at all. But eventually gravity would catch up with you and it would be really bad. But it's the same thing, if you can freely fall to the earth with nothing hindering you, you're not experiencing any gravity, you know, in your local area. If you're, if you're enclosed relative to your local area, relative to your container, you're weightless. So her motion canceled out gravity. Einstein looked at this and said, if that's really true, if your motion can get rid of a force, then you're not dealing with a force at all. Because there's no way a physical force can be counteracted by motion. So he said, that must mean gravity's not a force. Now, please understand, throughout all of his education, he was taught gravity is a force. And in fact, the equation for gravity is F, which stands for force, <laughs> equals GM1M2 over R squared. So that F, every time he worked a problem with gravity, it reinforced the idea that it's a force. But he came to the conclusion that it must not be a force. So he must figure out what gravity is. And so he developed what we call general relativity. And he had to first develop special relativity to get to general relativity. But when he eventually got to general relativity, he showed that no, gravity is not a force at all. It's a consequence of how matter bends space. This was revolutionary. And it allowed us to understand all sorts of things. We don't, and without general relativity, the, the global positioning system wouldn't work. I don't know if you know this, but time on the satellites in the global positioning system runs faster than it does here. If I put two clocks that are perfectly synchronized and then put one of them up on a satellite, satellite, it will tick faster. And if we didn't take that into account, the global positioning system wouldn't work and my, our Garmin wouldn't have gotten us here. It's all because Einstein figured out that gravity is not a force and as a result, lots of weird things happen. So despite the fact that for yeah, roughly 400 years, everybody thought gravity was a force, and despite the fact he was brought up that way, and despite the fact he kept writing F equals, he figured out that just because of this, gravity is not a force. That's what genius is. To take something you've been taught for 400 years and say, hey, maybe that's not right because of this. Not maybe that's not right because I don't like it, but maybe that's not right because of this. That's what genius is. And that's what we hope we can foster with our children. And here's what happens when you can do this. And I think this goes back to playing. You know, we think of playing as being recreation and academics and studying as being work, right? But in the end, children ought to learn that they can play with academics. They can play with what they're learning, you know? And I don't think you foster that very well in school, but you can foster that at home. Here's what happens. 
when you can do this. So there was a 10-year-old girl, Clara Lazen. She was at a Montessori school. Now, if you don't know what that term, Montessori, Montessori school is about as close to homeschooling as you can get and still be in a school. It emphasizes individual learning at the child's own pace. They don't have a set curriculum they have to complete. They're allowed to explore. So if everybody else is studying bugs, but this uh, uh, child is much more interested in the anteaters that eat the bugs, she's allowed to study the anteaters instead. So it's much more independent, much more focused on the child's interests and the freedom to explore. So uh, she was told the basic rules about chemical bonding. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these things before. It's what we call a molecular model kit. In a molecular model kit, uh, the balls represent atoms. So the black balls here are carbon atoms and the white balls are hydrogen atoms. And the sticks in between, the springs in between, represent bonds that hold them together. Now we make these molecular model kits so that each individual atom has the right number of holes to accommodate the right number of sticks to indicate how often they will bond. So every one of these black balls has four holes in it because carbon tends to like to make four bonds. Whereas the white balls have only one hole in them because hydrogen tends to like to make only one bond. Uh, one, one bond. So she was told this, and this is how these models work. Um, and uh, as long as you have all the holes filled with sticks, then you have a molecule. You have something that could exist. Now I have to tell you, as a chemist, when I read about this, I said this is the stupidest way to teach chemistry. Because in the end, these balls and sticks have a real physical reason. And why would you play with the balls and sticks until you learn the physical reason? So the proper way to teach this is to teach them about something called Lewis electron dot structures and show them the chemistry behind this bonding. And then when you've showed them what these balls and sticks can do, then you start very simply. You take one carbon and you put four sticks in it to say, okay, carbon likes to have four bonds because of what you learned before. And then you put four hydrogens on each stick and you say, this is a molecule of methane. This is natural gas. And then you show them the next most simple molecule and you start building that. That's the proper way to do this. It's not how he did it. He just said, take the balls, fill them with sticks, and as long as all the holes are filled, you've got a molecule. And so then they, they were, the students were simply told, play with it. Make a cool molecule. Now these kids know nothing about chemistry, right? So they start throwing together these molecules, basically making dog shapes and all these other things. So not, and, and to me, I would say this is a wasted day. This is a completely wasted day. Well, Clara Lazen got done with her model, and she took it to her teacher, and she said, is this a real mo a molecule? And of course, her teacher didn't know, but he looked, and he saw all the holes were filled and so forth, and he said, yeah, I suppose it's possible. But she really wanted to know, is this a real molecule? So he had a friend who was a professor of chemistry at Humboldt State University. And the, he said, well, I'll, I'll take a picture of it. I'll take a snap of it. I'll send it to my friend. And let's see, see what he says. So he sent this snap to the, to the, to the chemistry professor. And the chemistry professor looked at it, used his database to see if this molecule had ever been made. And, and came back and said, no, no one's ever made this molecule before, but it does look like it's possible it exists. So he actually did some high-intensity computer calculations and showed that the, mo 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 uh, the molecule was stable. So he said, yeah, it's possible. So in the end, this 10-year-old, who is now 11, the ripe old age of 11 by now, the chemist at Humboldt State University and the teacher all together published a paper in the Journal of Theoretical and Computational Chemistry on this new molecule. Now, I don't know any other 11-year-old who's published in the academic literature. So obviously, my thought of this method of educating about molecules is wrong. In fact, this is a valid way of doing things. In the end, not only did it help Clara learn a little bit about chemistry, it helped chemists learn a little bit about chemistry. Right? And in fact, according to the calculations, it's thought that this molecule could be a new kind of explosive which everybody wants, of course. Um, so currently, you know, people are thinking about how they might make it and so forth. But the point is, this is nothing like what a teacher would do. You know, if I were standing up in front of my college chemistry class lecturing, I would never all give them molecular models and just say, play. You know, that's a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. But clearly, I'm wrong when it comes to that. If we can get kids to play, right, while they're doing academics, it can really foster a lot of creativity. 
Now, that's, remember, there were three things, and I want to re, uh, re- remind you what they are again. So number one was a high degree of attention focused on the child by parents and adults expressed in intentional educational measures and usually abundant love. Second is reduced contact with the peer group. And the third is a significant amount of imaginative play. Now, when you look at those three, does that remind you of anything? <laughs> this is homeschooling, right? <laughs> And that's what's really, it's not remarkable to me because, in fact, at least one of these homeschooled uh, students I have, I've kind of kept up with him, and he is a certified genius, right? Uh, so there is this, there is, you know, I, I think it's not surprising that he thinks these three things are common in a lot of geniuses' lives, and it's not surprising to me that it turns out to be common and, and, and associated with homeschooling. And I really think this, for, for, you know, if you're thinking about whether it's good, for example, to pull them out of school or to not have them in school because of the peer group and so forth, I think the, the study can tell you, actually, it's probably better for them, especially from a genius standpoint. Now, um, here's, here's sort of the money quote that comes from this study. So this is actually in the academic literature. <clears throat> It might be remarked that the mass education of our public school system is, in its way, a vast experiment on the effect of reducing all three of the above factors to minimal values and should, accordingly, tend to suppress the occurrence of genius. So what he's saying is, here's what these guys made them geniuses, and our school is doing precisely the opposite. (laughs) Right? (laughs) So if I'm right, most likely we should be suppressing the occurrence of genius. And at least Sir Ken Robinson would agree that in the end, the mass education system we have isn't promoting genius anymore. It's promoting making good workers, but it's not promoting geniuses anymore, right? Now, I do have to tell you, not all homeschooled children will become geniuses, right? Because there is a mix of talent and environment that come together to make a genius. But what homeschooling gives the student is the freedom to develop his or her talents to the best of his or her ability. And that's the real key. And that's what I noticed with my daughter. My daughter's not a genius, and she'll readily admit that as well as I am. I will. But nevertheless, she went to one of the top universities in the U.S. She would have never made it to that university if she had continued in public school. She would have never gotten in because her scores were way too low. And she would have never survived had she gotten in. But once we started homeschooling her, even though she's not a genius, she developed her talents to the best of her ability, and it allowed her to not only get into this university, but also be, ex- be, be successful in it and get that degree in sociology, which just shows that God has a sense of humor. All right, so that's the key. It's not necessarily that you're going to become geniuses, but I do think homeschooling gives you the freedom to be able to develop your child's abilities to their best.